Today we will be discussing the 8th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. This chapter is entitled Attaining the Supreme. In the last verse of the previous chapter, Lord Krishna described how one can know Krishna even at the time of death. This chapter begins with a question by Arjuna about remembering Krishna at the time of death. Arjuna inquired from Krishna, how can those engaged in devotional service know you at the time of death? This is Arjuna's question. Now this question is significant because at the time of death, the bodily functions are disrupted and the mind may be in a panic stricken strait. At such a time, one may not be able to remember Krishna. So therefore, this question is significant. Krishna begins his reply by stating that it is very important to remember him at the time of death. What is the reason? He says, whoever at the end of his life quits his body remembering me alone, at once attains my nature. Of this there is no doubt. So the result of remembering Krishna at the time of death, as Krishna says here, results in at once attaining Krishna's nature. Now Krishna's nature is completely spiritual. So attaining Krishna's nature means attaining the spiritual world the abode of Krishna, the spiritual abode of Krishna. So, Srila Prabhupada explains, here the importance of Krishna consciousness is stressed by Krishna himself. Anyone who quits his body in Krishna consciousness is at once transferred to the spiritual abode of the Supreme Lord Krishna. Remembrance of Krishna is not possible for the impure soul who has not practiced Krishna consciousness in devotional service. To remember Krishna, one should chant the Maha Mantra, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, constantly. So Prabhupada is teaching us we should chant this Hare Krishna mantra constantly. And Lord Chaitanya teaches us that in order to chant constantly, one should practice chanting with humility and tolerance. These are two particular um, qualities that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is mentioning. To practice humility, uh, one should become humbler than the blade of grass. Become very, very humble. And one should also be more tolerant than the tree. <clears throat> In such a mood, one should offer all respect to others without expecting any respect in return. In this consciousness, one will be able to leave the body successfully remembering Krishna. And in this way, one can attain Krishna's supreme abode after death. Now, Krishna states the general law which gives us our next body after quitting the present body, after death. He says, Whatever state of being one remembers when he quits this body, that state he will attain without fail. Therefore, Krishna tells Arjuna, you should always think of me in the form of Krishna and at the same time carry out your prescribed duty of fighting. With your activities dedicated to me and your mind and intelligence fixed on me, you will attain me without a doubt. So specifically Arjuna is told 
that he should uh, think of Krishna and at the same time carry out his duty of fighting. Now, Srila Prabhupada explains that uh, this particular instruction to Arjuna is very important for all men engaged in material activities. People may uh, have this question, common people, that we are engaged always in doing some work. So, how can we think of Krishna or remember Krishna? Always. So, the Lord does not say that one should give up his prescribed duties. One can continue to perform his prescribed duties and at the same time think of Krishna by chanting Hare Krishna. This will free one from material contamination and engage the mind and intelligence in Krishna. Chanting Hare Krishna actually engages our mind and intelligence in Krishna. By chanting Krishna's names, one will be transferred to the supreme planet Krishna Loka without a doubt. This is what Srila Prabhupada explains. Krishna further says, He who meditates on the Supreme Lord, his mind constantly engaged in in remembering the Supreme Lord, undeviated from the path, such a person is sure to reach the supreme abode of Krishna. So, Srila Prabhupada says, here Lord Krishna stresses the importance of remembering Him. Once memory of Krishna is revived by chanting the Hare Krishna Mahamantra, The scriptures explain that uh, we have a eternal relationship with Krishna. So, Krishna is actually not a new person for us. It is just that we have somehow forgotten him having come to this world. We don't belong to this world. We belong to the spiritual world. We belong to Krishna's own personal abode. But having forgotten Krishna, we are placed in this material world. So, this world is a place of forgetfulness of Krishna. Therefore, Prabhupada says, one has to revive his memory of Krishna and that is possible by chanting the Hare Krishna mantra. By this practice of chanting and hearing the sound vibration of Hare Krishna. So, it is not silent chanting. It is not chanting in the mind. It is actually vibrating the tongue to produce the sound Hare Krishna. You have to produce the sound. Once ear, tongue and mind are engaged. The tongue is en should be engaged in vibrating the Hare Krishna mantra. The ear should be engaged in hearing. And the mind should be engaged in attentively hearing. So, in this way, uh, one should practice meditation on Krishna. This type of meditation is very easy to practice and it helps one attain the Supreme Lord. This is what Srila Prabhupada explains. Next, Krishna describes the difficult process of Ashtanga Yoga to remember Krishna at the time of death. And later on, he will describe the easy process of Bhakti Yoga. The Ashtanga Yogi has to detach himself from all types of sense enjoyment. He should turn his senses inward and fix the mind on the heart and his life air at the top of the head. See, this is the difficult process of Ashtanga Yoga. It is dealing with the senses by withdrawing them from external attractions 
and focusing them inside, then fixing the mind on the heart. The heart is the is the is the place where the Ashtanga Yogi uh, conceives a form of Paramatma and fixes the mind in concentration on that Paramatma. And he has to raise his life air, prana, to the top of the head. These are all very, very difficult processes. Krishna doesn't mention the details of the process. He just briefly mentions uh, the very, very basic uh, points for an Ashtanga Yogi to practice remembering Krishna. After being situated in this yoga practice and chanting Om, if one thinks of the Supreme Lord and quits his body, he will certainly reach the spiritual planets. So he should be situated in yoga and he should be uh, vibrating the syllable Om. This is for the Ashtanga Yogis. In contrast with this difficult process of Ashtanga Yoga, Krishna next describes the easy process of Bhakti Yoga. What does he say about Bhakti Yoga? For one who always remembers me without deviation, I am easy to obtain because of his constant engagement in devotional service. The easy process of Bhakti Yoga is constantly chant Hare Krishna, that's all. There is no difficult uh, process of uh, lifting the life air. It is said it is at the bottom of the spine. And there are six different energy centers called Shat Chakra. And one has to gradually lift that prana from the bottom of the spine to the top of the head. Very, very difficult process. Hmm? There are a lot of uh, details involved. Huh? But the devotee simply practices chanting Hare Krishna. And in this way, through chanting Hare Krishna, he is able to remember Krishna. Because Krishna and his name, Krishna and his um, the, even the sound of his name are identical. This is the special uh, thing about Krishna. Since he is completely spiritual, there is no difference between his name, his form, his qualities, his personality. There is no difference. Hmm? This is described in the scriptures as the absolute nature of Krishna. The absolute nature. We know in this world an object and its name are different. That's why this world is called a relative world. Just like if I say water my Quench, my thirst won't be quenched if I say water, 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 water. The water sound or water name is different from the water itself. So to quench my thirst, I actually have to take water and drink. Whereas Krishna and his name are identical. So it is explained that when somebody chants the name of Krishna, Let's say I vibrate my tongue and say Krishna. Krishna is actually present on the tongue. Though we may not be able to, in the beginning, we may not be able to perceive Krishna's presence. But actually Krishna appears on the tongue. This form of uh, Krishna is called the incarnation of Krishna in this Kali Yuga. Incarnation of Krishna. Krishna has incarnated as his name, 
in Kali Yuga. And he is very easily accessible to anybody who simply vibrates their tongue and says Krishna. To systematically practice this uh, type of devotion, devotional service, we are uh, advised to chant Krishna's name in the form of the Hare Krishna mantra. And Krishna further says, after attaining me, the devotees, he is particularly talking of the devotees, never return to this temporary world which is full of miseries because they have attained the highest perfection. Here what is implied is that there is a difference between a yogi who may transfer himself to some higher planet. Let us say a yogi may uh, transfer himself to the Swarga Loka, heavenly planets. And there are still higher planets in this universe. There are planets like uh, Maharloka, Janaloka, Tapoloka, Brahmaloka. So many different grades of planets are there. But Krishna's particular personal abode or personal planet, Krishna Loka, is not in this material world. It is beyond all the material planets. It is beyond even Brahma Loka. Krishna's planet is in the spiritual world, completely apart from this material world. So, attaining Krishna's planet is the highest perfection. Attaining liberation is called perfection. But, after liberation what? If that question is raised, there is activity, there is life in the liberated state. That is called devotional service. Uh, activities in the liberated state is called devotional service. Hmm. So therefore, uh, those who attain Krishna's personal abode, Krishna's personal planet, they engage in devotional service to Krishna in Krishna's personal abode. So that is the highest perfection, the supreme perfection. Next, Krishna describes the nature of this material world in which we are living. He contrasts this with his personal abode. He says there are many different planets of different grades in this world, but all of them are described as places of repeated birth and death. In Krishna's own words, he says, from the highest planet in the material world down to the lowest, all are places of misery wherein there is repeated birth and death. The highest planet in this material world is described as Brahma Loka, the personal abode of Brahma in this world. And the lowest is called Patala. It is the lowest planet. Now, lowest and highest is in terms of uh, the living conditions. Relatively, some are better and some are not so good. The earth, the planet on which we are living now, is in the middle. So, uh, the higher planets have more facilities for uh, material comforts for material enjoyment and the lower planets have relatively lesser comforts. In the lower planets there is more suffering and in the upper planets there is more enjoyment. But in any case, 
whether lower planets or higher planets, every planet there is repetition of birth and death. And in between birth and death, there are always some miseries. So Krishna further says, but one who attains my abode never takes birth again in this miserable material world. So, going to Krishna's particular personal planet means never again one has to take birth in this world. Now, the yogis who transfer themselves, let us say, to the um, heavenly planet, they cannot permanently remain there. Every place is a temporary place, every planet. Hmm? That is explained by Krishna in the next verse, that at the beginning of Brahma's day, there is creation and at the end of Brahma's day, there is destruction. So again and again, when Brahma's day arrives, all the living beings are created and with the arrival of Brahma's night, at the end of his day, then there is Brahma's night. All the living beings are helplessly destroyed. So, this goes on cyclically, this creation and destruction at the beginning and end of Brahma's day. In contrast with this material world of repeated birth and death, Krishna describes there is a spiritual world. It is of another nature, another quality. It is a spiritual nature, a spiritual quality. Uh, that spiritual world is described by Krishna as the eternal world. Because it is spiritual by nature or spiritual quality or spiritual quality, it is eternal. There is no destruction ever of Krishna's personal abode. It is supreme and it is never destroyed. When all in this world is destroyed, the spiritual world remains as it is. So, the cyclical uh, creation and destruction of this material world is not there in the spiritual world. Actually, in the spiritual world, there is nothing like creation. Everything there exists eternally, always exists, is never destroyed. Krishna further describes that the Supreme Lord, who is greater than all, who is the, the greatest, is attainable only by pure devotion. Hmm? Krishna stresses this point. Uh, by Ashtanga Yoga, by karma yoga, by jnana yoga, one cannot attain Krishna's abode. It's only by bhakti yoga one can attain Krishna's abode. Now, Krishna further explains that uh, there is a difference in the way the Ashtanga yogis uh, leave their body at the time of death and the way devotees leave their body. Krishna says, those who do not follow the system Bhakti Yoga, they have to select a proper time to leave the body in order to reach the spiritual world. That means, the devotees, the Bhakti Yogis, they are guaranteed to reach the spiritual world after quitting this body simply by practicing Bhakti Yoga. That is not the case with the other types of yogis. The other types of yogis, they have to select what is called as an auspicious time to leave their body. The auspicious time for the yogis to leave their body is described by Krishna. It is 
during the influence of the fiery god in the light at an auspicious moment of the day during the fortnight of the waxing moon during the six months when the sun travels in the north all these conditions have to be fulfilled just like we know there is uttarayana and dakshinayana six months of the year the sun travels north it's called uttarayana in sanskrit six months of the year and another six months of the year is called dakshinayana that is when the sun travels south then uh, in a month there is the fortnight of the waxing moon and the waning moon waxing moon is called shukla paksha the bright fortnight of the moon and krishna paksha is the dark fortnight of the moon then we have experience of day and night so like this the ashtanga yogi or any other yogi other than the bhakti yogi has to choose a particular auspicious moment that moment is uh, the moment when there is the influence of different devatas who arrange for the passage of the particular soul in order to transfer that soul or that person the yogi to a particular destination so shri la prabhupad explains in charge of different uh, facilities in this material world there are different devatas just like day time there is a particular devata who controls the movements of those who quit their body during the day night time there is another devata who controls the night time similarly during the fortnight of the waxing moon during shukla paksha during the bright fortnight of the moon there is a particular devata in charge and during the dark fortnight of the moon the krishna paksha there is another devata so like this there are devatas who control the different times uttarayana dakshinayana uh, shukla paksha krishna paksha day and night all these are controlled so at a particular auspicious time only when so many conditions are fulfilled at that time if the ashtanga yogi is able to arrange to leave the body now the ashtanga yogis they practice breath control one of the reasons for controlling their breath is to choose the auspicious time to leave the body is to choose the time of death otherwise if they not able to choose the time then they cannot be certain of reaching the spiritual abode of krishna after quitting the body at the time of death so this is the difficulty for the ashtanga yogis and the other yogis hmm? if the yogi can leave his body at this auspicious time then all the conditions mentioned are fulfilled then the yogi goes to the spiritual world otherwise if he leaves the body at any other time 
from this world, then he does not go to the spiritual world after death. He takes birth again in this material world. So, Krishna summarizes this according to Vedas for the yogi, other than the bhakti yogi, other yogis, there are two ways of passing from this world. He describes the two ways as one in light or one in darkness. So, Krishna says, when the yogi passes in light, he does not come back again to this material world. He does not take birth again. But when he passes in darkness, he returns to this material world. So, what is this passing in light and passing in darkness? To leave the body at the auspicious time, where all those conditions are fulfilled, is called passing in light. And to leave the body at any other time is called passing in darkness. Now, Krishna says one very important uh, advantage for those practicing Bhakti Yoga. He says that he recommends the path of Bhakti Yoga because by practicing Bhakti Yoga or devotional service, the devotee is guaranteed to reach the supreme abode of Lord Krishna. This is what Krishna himself says in this particular chapter. Hmm? He says actually, the, although the devotees know these two paths, uh, the path of passing away in light and the path of, path, path of passing away in darkness, they know these two paths, they are never bewildered because they are fixed in devotion. Therefore, Krishna says, be always fixed in devotion and in that way you are guaranteed to reach Krishna's personal abode. So, for the devotee, for those practicing Bhakti Yoga, it does not matter when they quit their body, when they die. It does not matter. So, this is the specific advantage, special advantage of practicing Bhakti Yoga. Not only that Bhakti Yoga is easier uh, than practice of Ashtanga Yoga, but Bhakti Yoga is also guaranteeing that our destination is Krishna's supreme abode. And that Krishna also describes as the highest perfection highest perfection. Huh? After reaching Krishna's abode, one will never again take birth in this material world. There is no more uh, rebirth. Hmm? So, reaching Krishna's abode is actually called ultimate liberation. Ultimate liberation. This is the uh, description of uh, reaching Krishna's abode, personal abode. <clears throat> now, there are a group of uh, spiritualists who only know about God as formless Brahman. This I was describing yesterday while discussing the seventh chapter, those who know only about God or absolute truth as impersonal Brahman or formless Brahman, they do not know anything about God as the supreme person having spiritual form, they do not know. Even if they are informed, they think all types of forms are material. They do not accept that there could be something like a spiritual form. For such spiritualists, 
actually there is no understanding of spiritual planets spiritual form spiritual name spiritual qualities nothing they have no understanding at all and they are very very stubborn about their understanding of the absolute truth or god as formless as without any qualities without any uh, uh, without any name without any form like that their description ultimately of god or understanding of god is all negating the material attributes just like in this world we have got a form but our form is a material form which is subject to destruction just like this body of ours but krishna's form is not like our form krishna's form is spiritual form similarly krishna's personal abode is not like the world we live in this world is subject to destruction krishna's personal planet is never subject to destruction that's exactly what krishna is saying in this chapter but the philosophers or the spiritualists who are called impersonalists they are called mayavadis they never accept they never understand this particular description in the bhagavad gita what krishna says about his personal abode they never accept that for them liberation means trying to merge into that formless brahman that is their understanding of liberation but in the shrimad bhagavatam it is explained that those who try to merge or become one with the formless brahman have no permanent uh position have no permanent position it is just a temporary position anybody who does not uh, aim to go to krishna's personal abode cannot have permanent liberation therefore reaching krishna's abode is called ultimate liberation and merely going to the spiritual sky the formless brahman is also described as the spiritual sky so reaching spiritual sky without shelter of the spiritual planet of krishna is a temporary position technically we may say somebody reaching the spiritual sky has attained liberation freedom from birth and death in this world but since they cannot remain there permanently actually they are not attain liberation because they if they don't promote themselves further to the spiritual planet they have to come back to this material world so scriptures describe the destination of those who are impersonalist mayavadis those who worship the impersonal brahman formless brahman their destination of attaining that formless brahman or becoming one with the formless brahman is a temporary place is not a permanent place therefore krishna here particularly says that be fixed in devotion 
so that you can attain my permanent abode and never again return to this material world. This only for devotees, this only for bhakti yogis. Krishna concludes this chapter by stressing the superiority of devotional service over all other different paths of yoga. He says, a person who accepts the path of devotional service is not bereft of the results derived from studying the Vedas, from performing austere sacrifices, from giving charity, from pursuing results of pious work. There are so many different paths. And all these paths, there is some specific benefit by following the particular path. Krishna says, for those who are engaged in Bhakti Yoga, simply by performing devotional service, they get the benefits of all other paths of Yoga. And in the end, the Bhakti Yogi alone reaches the supreme eternal abode of Krishna. What about the others? Even though they have some benefits by following their particular path of yoga, other yoga systems, they don't reach Krishna's personal abode. No. They have to take birth again in this material world. So therefore, again, Krishna is stressing Bhakti Yoga. So I'll stop here. This is the end of the chapter. Srimad Bhagavad Gita ki jaya Shri Prabhupada ki jaya.